move on to the next session, which is the empirical evidence of corporate or business responses to taxes. And the two presenters are Dr. Kevin uh, Hassett and Ms. Catherine Newmar. Thanks a lot, Peter. And I just turned the air conditioning on so I can put my coat on. Um, so, so while everybody's milling about, I'll just start. Uh, uh, Katie and I are uh, re really grateful uh, to, to be here, and, and uh, we've been big fans of uh, the research uh, that you guys here at Rice uh, do for a long time, and it's great to finally come down and, and have a chance to visit you. Uh, Rob, Robin Sickles taught me my first econometrics class. So to the extent that you have, he left, uh, so I get to make fun of him. Uh, one of the things I learned best from him is you never try to tag him out at home plate in a softball game. <laughs> he was famous for wiping people out, that, no matter what their size. Uh, second <laughs> <It's not the laughs> team. Um, well, uh, so, so Katie and I uh, have uh, done a, really an update of the handbook of uh, public economics article that uh, Glenn Hubbard and I wrote about uh, five years ago, uh, and, and it's been a really exciting time in the investment literature and a really uh, fun literature to be a part of. Uh, you know, one, one of the things I, I notice in some literatures is that when people say things that disagree with one another, uh, then they all get angry and unfriendly, but in the investment literature it seems like it's a really jovial uh, crowd, and even though uh, one of the, the, the main uh, conclusions that I've reached in a lot of my research in the last five years is that a whole bunch of the stuff Glenn Hubbard did was wrong, uh, then, then <laughs> where Glenn and I are, are still talking. Um, and so what I'd like to do is uh, sort of assume, uh, after a little bit of introduction, uh, that you kind of know where we were or, you know, about five years ago, uh, and then talk about what, what's been going on uh, at the frontier. And I'd have to say that, that uh, I, th I think that the frontier is about as exciting, and the open questions are about as exciting as I've seen, and I have the sense Especially, uh, and I, you know, I can't wait to, to, to see you talk a little bit more about this, and maybe at lunch or something. But, but, but especially, I have a sense that Emmanuel is very close to really, really important findings. But, but we haven't seen them yet. But, but, but we're really, really close. Uh, and so, so let's first. I'm going to just start with with what I think is the basic econometric problem uh, in an in investment, and and it goes approximately like this. Uh, that uh, up until right about the time that, that Ro Robin Sickles was wiping out catchers in, in, when I was in graduate school, uh, it, it was very, very hard to find a paper that ever found a user cost effect on, on anything. Uh, and if you just sort of make a chart, and this is a chart that Glenn and I uh, put in the handbook chapter, uh, then, then you, can, you can sort of see why. Uh, and, and, and it kind of goes like this. That suppose that, that all of a sudden something happens that makes it so that the economy is going up a lot and I think economists aren't very good at guessing exactly what that might be in real time. Uh, then, uh, you know, GDP's booming, investment's booming, and interest rates are going up. Uh, and, and so if you just sort of run, run a regression of, uh, this is a, the dark line is producers' durable equipment, and the, and the sort of uh, dotted line is a cost of capital series, which is the cost of capital series that the guys at the Fed show the governors. Uh, when, they're, when they're briefing them in the Green Book uh, for the Open Market Committee meetings. Then you, you, you see, in fact, that there's a, uh, a correlation that's, that's maybe even statistically significant, uh, but it's, it's the, wrong, the wrong sign. <laughs> and and so, so the interest rates tend to be going up when we're investing a lot. And, and, and so uh, a, as the literature was, was sort of existed when I was in graduate school, then what happened was that there were a whole bunch of studies uh, where people would take time series data uh, uh, and, uh, and investment, uh, investment and user costs and run regressions and find kind of nothing. Uh, uh, and, and, and I almost think that it took ingenuity. It took ingenuity to find nothing uh, because the first thing that they might have found was actually the wrong sign and significant. Um, now, while that was going on, there were other things in the time series data uh, that were compelling uh, and fun to, uh, to, the to, to theorize about. And, and, uh, and this, this chart here shows you uh, one of them that, that uh, uh, is, is still clear clearly in the data. And that is that there's a very, very high correlation uh, at the aggregate level between cash flow and investment. <laughs> and so uh, if firms are making lots of money, they're buying lots of machines. Um, and if you run that regression, uh, then you're going to find 
that the user cost, uh, the Jorgensonian user cost that, w that we public finance people want to use, at least as our first line of defense of figuring out what's going to happen, just doesn't matter. Uh, and cash flow matters a heck of a lot. Uh, and, and so a whole uh, uh, industry, really, of, of papers emerged um, right about the time, uh, right about the time uh, that, that the sort of new uh, public finance and investment started happening, um, uh, that tried to understand why, the, why this cash flow effect was there uh, and, and relate it to um, liquidity constraints. Uh, I'll, I'll return to that in a little bit, but right now we're trying to get sort of correlations on the table. Um, but, but it's not just cash flow that, that seemed uh, to be really highly correlated uh, with, with investment. Um, it, it's also true that, that an accelerator or rate, rate of change of business output was really, really highly correlated with investment. And there's a very, very influential and, and important paper that you should still go back and read uh, for its historic value. And it should be on your reading list. An uh, 88 paper by Bernanke, uh, Bone, and, and Reese. Uh, where, where they did a very, very careful econometric analysis of sort of all the, the investment models that you could put into the, the toolkit right now, uh, and then ran uh, very cleverly designed uh, horse races, forecasting horse races between them, uh, and found that, that the accelerator model uh, was the champion that got the gold, gold medal. Uh, and, and so that's kind of good, I guess, from the point of view if you're a Fed forecaster who needs to tell the Open Market Committee what investment's going to be next quarter. <laughs> It's just like, tell me what GDP growth was, and I'll, I'll give you a pretty precise estimate of what investment's going to be next quarter, maybe. Uh, but it's, it's bad from the point of view of understanding exactly why, uh, because when we actually put it in and put down, write down our models, then we got a lot of other stuff that ought to determine investment, uh, and, and that ain't it. Uh, that ain't it. Oh, there's a little bit. The output that is in the, in the denominator and so on. So there, there is a role for it, but, but a lot of the stuff that, that, that we want uh, to understand uh, the effect of and probably believe ex ante uh, on a theoretical basis, it should matter, just didn't show up. And so, and so then, um, this, was, this is while, uh, while, while Alan and I were, were still at Penn. Um, then one, one of the first things uh, that, that, in fact, th those charts were sort of like the start of a couple of papers for Alan and I at Penn. And one of the first things that Alan and I did, and, and it's not this chart, so you can sort of pretend it's not there for a minute. Uh, one of the first things that we, we did is, is just look to see if the problem was that everybody had misspecified uh, the user cost. Or to put it another way, Al Alan had kind of worked out what a user cost specification should look like in theory with a model with adjustment costs. Uh, and, and it's basically that the firm's investment today should depend on uh, a weighted average of current and future Jorgensonian user costs um, and, and, and what they expect that to be. And so it could be that firms do actually obey a model like that. Uh, and uh, that all those things that look like they affect investment a lot, like, say, accelerators, are useful for project projecting the future user costs. Uh, because, the, because the regression horse races that people had used in the past would basically take a one period Jorgensen user cost uh, uh, and, and sort of see if it could beat it output and cash flow. Uh, and so, so the first thing that we did, and this was, turned out to be a Journal of Public Economics paper, is we said, well, let's see if we can, if we can measure that user cost uh, a better uh, and, and take account of the fact that it's forward looking and estimate the rational expectations model, uh, then does the user cost do a little bit better? Uh, and, and we found that it, that it did. But it, but it wasn't it wasn't like great shakes. I, I mean, the, the, the coefficients seem seem still uh, uh, pretty darn small. And then we had this idea. Well, maybe it's just still at the aggregate aggregate data uh, that there's a problem. And so and so uh, we agreed to write a Carnegie Rochester paper, just extending our work uh, to go down to the asset and industry level. Uh, and and uh, I can still remember this to the, to this day that that I, I ran. What we did is we we made this big panel. Where we reran our regressions from the from the aggregate uh, paper in the Journal of Public Economics, uh, and uh, pooled it all together using panel techniques and estimated the coefficient, and once again got I think the uh, the wrong sign and statistically significant was about the first thing, uh, and and we had some some interesting non-stationary errors for some of the assets like computers and stuff, but it was a total disaster. I mean it looked just awful, and and, and so then we said for a minute like, we took a step back. And, and, we, and we, we decided to, to just think for a moment about what was going on from the earlier charts. And we thought to ourselves, well, 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 maybe what we need to do is try to find some kind of source of variation that is different from sort of the interest rate output nexus that are going up and down year to year. Um, and uh, one thing that we hypothesized might be different 
would be the effect on different types of assets of a tax change around a tax reform. Um, and so uh, specifically, so here, here's the uh, 80, 86 Tax Act, uh, then uh, they, there were a lot of changes to the user cost uh, that involved sort of like top-level policy. And those changes, because of different asset lives and depreciation rates and so on, will have a different effects depending on whether you're talking about a truck or a machine tool or something. And, and, and so we hypothesized, what if, what if those things are truly exogenous? So, so, so and, and, and actually, if I had lived in Washington at the time, I, we probably never would have got there because I see so much lobbying. <laughs> uh, but, but, but we said, what if those things are exogenous? Then maybe if we just look at the cross-section pattern of uh, changes in the user costs and changes in investment around the Tax Act, then that might be the way to identify the user cost effect. Uh, and see if, if uh, you know, the assets that got hammered the most uh, uh, by the tax reform are the ones that had their investment go down the most uh, after the tax reform. And, and, and this, this chart uh, was, was sort of the first chart that, that we made, really, uh, from, from this exercise. Uh, and and, and so I bring it up uh, just out of its historical interest. You see, I still don't, I don't have the data anymore, so it's actually, God knows what software we used to make this chart. It was probably Gauss. Um, and, and, and so, so, so what we have is uh, on the chart is the the investment error uh, on the bottom and the user cost error on the top uh, by asset class, uh, and you can see that they're pretty negatively correlated. Um, and, and we went on, uh, and then Glenn Hubbard and Jason Cummins and I, in a Brookings paper that followed up on this and, and extended it to really micro data uh, to, to try to estimate user cost elasticities uh, from this or user cost coefficients uh, from this, uh, and, and found that, that they were maybe about twice the size of what, what Alan and I got in our Journal of Public Economics piece that found something that was still kind of small. Um, subsequently, uh, there, there's been a, an enormous amount, so pretend that slide's not there, I should probably just I'll leave it there for a minute. There's been an enormous amount of work in, in, in lots of other investment models, uh, and the coefficients still vary a lot. Uh, but, but, but there's sort of unanimity now that, that the, the coefficients are, are statistically significant. Um, and uh, it, in Euler equation uh, studies, people tend to get elasticities that are, that are pretty high. Um, in uh, studies that, that are sort of user cost uh, like, like, like the Carnegie one that, that we originally had, they can be sort of around a half. Um, and uh, it's, I think that you know, Glenn and I is cited in, in, in the handbook uh, paper, a gazillion papers, that, that pretty much now say it looks like, looks like the user cost matter, matters. And, uh, and, and Bob and I started out sort of at different points on this, but we've really converged, I think, over time uh, to, well, we, we can talk about that in the discussion, but, but Bob has a paper in a journal of public economics where his range is like 0.2 to 0.5, and he, he prefers the 0.2. Uh, but I actually prefer the 0.5. I like, I like, the, I like your, media, your uh, uh, median regressions. Um, okay, so, so, so while that's been going on, uh, there's been, uh, you might recall uh, that, that there's been a, a, a sort of explosion of theoretical work uh, uh, in investment models where people have tried to, to think about uh, what uh, might we be doing wrong in our modeling uh, that's really implausible. Um, there's, a, there's a very famous uh, and interesting paper by Cooper and Haltewanger that has some sort of fun facts in it uh, that I commend to you. But the basic idea is this, that, that maybe uh, the, the sort of quadratic adjustment, of co cost, adjustment costs that are built into the sort of Q models, uh, like, like the one uh, that Alan used to get that forward weighted average of the user costs, uh, maybe those are kind of ridiculous because if you're a firm and you're actually going to do something other than sort of changing a machine at the margin, uh, then uh, what you've got to do is kind of shut things down for a while and a lot of people are going to maybe have to, you know, take a couple weeks vacation. And, and so, so, so it's really kind of like a, there's a big lump sum that you're going to have to pay in order to do this, uh, which could make it so, so that your uh, decision to invest wouldn't just sort of smoothly adjust up and down depending on every little parameter change, but rather you might hang around and wait for a while until you really thought you had way less capital than you want, and then you might buy a whole, whole bunch at, at once. Um, and and so, so the models that, that have that kind of feature that there's uh, a, a really wonderful, wonderful application by Caballero and, and I guess Haltewanger, um, and uh, they, they have, tend to have like kind of an SS, if you remember the old SS and inventory model, an SS feature where, where uh, your, your capital stock will get low, 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 where rather, relative to what you want, and then you'll get down to the, to the lower band, lower S band, uh, and, and then you'll invest like crazy. 
and, and maybe even get too much because you anticipate that you're going to be holding, holding off uh, uh, in, the, in the future again. Now, now these, these models have been applied, uh, uh, these, these models that allow for alternative adjustment costs have been, been applied by, by numerous authors. Uh, Abel and Everly also have a, have a great paper. Uh, I, I put Barnett and Sacalaris here um, only to, to show uh, uh, that they're probably the best people at making a chart. <laughs> and, I, and I wanted to put, put a chart up. Uh, I, I don't think it's necessarily like the, the decisive paper in this. But, but there's very clear uh, in the data nonlinearity in the relationship between, say, Tobin's Q uh, and investment. Um, I, I would expect that we would see that nonlinearity if we were clever enough to look for it uh, in user costs as well. Um, and investment, th this is the, the investment function that they get, sort of doesn't happen very much for low levels of Q, and then you get Q. As Q goes up, uh, it goes up a lot, and then as, as Q gets really high, it goes down again. Uh, my, my, my belief is that the really high Q result is coming from the fact that, that the higher the Q gets in CompuStat, the less Q has meaning uh, be, because there's just so much else going on. Uh, now, uh, let's, let's turn, turn to cash now. Um, so, so if you think that people are finding that the user cost matters uh, more than, than it used to uh, and, and it's statistically significant, then in some sense that puts a, the literature in, in a tricky spot. Uh, because you might argue that what happened was that we started off sort of in, in the mid-80s with, with two branches of literature going in opposite directions. Uh, one branch said, well, let, let's uh, see, see if we can maybe measure the, the tax var variables better, and, and maybe we can get those models to work better. And, and, and then maybe we'll, we'll revive the user costs of just the straight old Jorgensen model or, or something with adjustment costs. And then another branch said, well, maybe the reason why that stuff doesn't matter is firms are liquidity constrained. And so what we need to do is develop these fancy models of liquidity constraints and think about who's constrained and then go out and look and see if we see those constraints in the data. Now, now that literature, the liquidity constraint literature, produced probably more papers. <laughs> and there is a heck of a lot of them. Uh, and uh, in, in an AER paper that, that is coming out this June that Steve Olner and Jason and I wrote, uh, we, we counted 50 papers that used Q, OLS, Q, and cash to do something. Uh, and, and, uh, and these papers pretty much found really, really small effects of Q, which is sort of the fundamental thing, uh, and big effects of cash. And they found patterns in it that they argued were consistent with liquidity constraints. And, and if, if that's where that literature really is, and the user cost literature is saying, well, no, actually these fundamentals matter a lot more than you think, then there's kind of a dissonance between, between those two branches. Now, I think that, that in the last three or four years, uh, there's been an explosion, an explosion of papers that have brought uh, the, the cash literature, I, I think, into, a, into a, 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 well, negative light's a harsh thing to say, that it's changed our mind about what we think about cash. Um, and, and, and the basic idea is, is really <coughs> leveraging off of the early charts that, that, uh, that there, there are things that are, ought to be correlated with each other just in the aggregate, and you have to fix uh, that before you make any conclusions. And another thing is that the fundamentals uh, that, drive, uh, that drive investment might be very poorly measured. Uh, other than cash, and if you don't have a good fundamental measure, uh, then cash could just be the only thing you got left, <laughs> and so it's explaining investment. Um, and in addition to those papers, there have been a number of theoretical advances that have talked about whether, well, would we really expect there to be like high cash sensitivity in li liquidity constrained firms or not? Um, there have been, and and the answer is no. Um, and and uh, other other papers have said, well, what what if we uh, we we try to define constrained. Uh, uh, different, um, but but in a financial marketly, uh, in a financial market way that's, that's that's reasonably attractive. That's Kaplan and Zagalis. Uh, then then do we think that constrained firms look like they're more cash sensitive? And and, and they they argue no, but Glenn still disputes uh, the the paper. Um, and, uh, and and then uh, if we measure the fundamentals uh, better, uh, then does cash go away? And that's that's where uh, where this paper that I'm about to show you a chart from comes from. And 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 this is too bad Robin's not here. Because uh, this uh, June uh, 2006 AER paper actually grew out of a problem set from his first econometrics class. <laughs> and, and, and here was this problem, problem set. He was teaching us how to do uh, uh, econometrics uh, in rational expectations models. And, and uh, it, his first bullet point, I remember it to this day, was you know, the best thing to do is to try to observe the expectation and to do OLS. <laughs> 
<laughs> if you can do that, then, then that's the best thing to do. You probably won't be able to, but before we go into GMM and all that other stuff, if you can observe the expectation, then OLS, and then that's what you should do, you should stop. And, and so, so wanting to do that, for, since, since that problem set, uh, uh, we, we finally found uh, the opportunity, uh, this paper started about, about six years ago, uh, at, while I was still at the Fed, uh, where, where uh, Jason and Steve and I recognized that, that analysts on Wall Street actually project future earnings for firms. And so what we could do is we could construct a Q measure out of analysts' expectations of future earnings um, that's based on, on, you know, it's like sort of an observable expectation. It's based on what they think about the future. And, and whether or not you think that the analysts are really good about predicting the future, uh, then if they think the same kind of things that the firms do, then it might be that their expectations about future earnings allows you to construct a Q variable uh, that predicts investment a lot better uh, than uh, had been done in the past. And um, we, so in this, in this paper, we constructed a variable that we call Q hat, and, and building up from CompuStat data and the analyst data that we got, is, which is from IBES, uh, this is what you get. Uh, we, we actually got it, made a Q, an aggregate Q, that's very, very highly correlated with investment. Uh, in micro, micro runs, we, we get uh, the Qs very significant, and most importantly, uh, cash, cash effects disappear uh, once you control for this Q. Um, and and uh, Tony Whitehead has a, has a bunch of stuff uh, that's done it in a slightly different way that reaches similar conclusions. And so I think that the cash, um, the cash story uh, is certainly not as convincing as, as it was when, when Glenn and I wrote the O2 paper. And, and so I don't think that we're at a, at a point where you need to be kind of creeped out by the fact that we simultaneously believe in lots of liquidity effects and that the user cost doesn't matter. I, I think that user cost probably, it, we, we're leaning more towards does matter and we're leaning le less towards cash. Um, that, that, by the way, is, uh, is what the equity market Q would look like. It's got, it's got an R squared of 0.03, where, whereas our, uh, our R squared, just with aggregate data, um, was, was 0.7 <laughs> from, from building up from analyst expectations. Um, and that's just to show what cash looks like with the same data. So, so, so that's, uh, I, I think, um, where, where the literature ha has, has evolved to. Um, and now there's some, some really interesting uh, work that's been generated uh, by uh, the latest tax changes. And I, I was joking with Jane uh, about them early, earlier, and she, she gave me this radiant smile when I said, well, at least it gave us something to study. <laughs> and, and she didn't like, like a lot of this stuff. Uh, but it did give us a lot to study and generate a whole bunch of, of interesting research. Now, you all know, know this stuff, but in 2001, uh, egg trade was the first thing that was passed. It was most, mostly uh, income, income taxes. Uh, then we had job creation and worker assistance in O2, uh, which gave us uh, temporary uh, partial expensing, um, which, which reminds me of the, the story that, that Musgrave uh, told me once at one of Allen's conferences uh, where, where uh, he, he talked about the, the way the investment tax credit was invented. And he said he was on an airplane with, uh, with President Kennedy, and, and, and he said, uh, uh, Kenny said, "Isn't there something we can do to stimulate investment?" And uh, and Musgrave said, "Yeah, we could uh, we could have accelerated depreciation." And uh, and Kennedy says, "I can't give a speech about that." Uh, and, and then uh, Dick thought for a moment. He said, "Well, we could make it a credit." <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and he said, hey, I love that. It's an investment tax credit. Um, well, well, temporary partial expensing is not, a, it's amazing that it happened in a world where people have to make speeches about things. Uh, but it did, it was 30% uh, in the O2 Act uh, and scheduled to expire, it increased uh, to 50% in O3 and scheduled to expire. And in O3, again, we cut the uh, dividend tax and uh, capital gains tax. Now, now these, uh, these changes, it turns out fortuitously, uh, existed in a world uh, where they allow us to explore some of the things that we understand the least about what's going on uh, in investment. In, um, in, in the user cost, uh, if we knew exactly what user cost it is that you need to look at to determine what happens when you change tax policy, uh, then you'd, you'd be home free. Uh, you could just look at whatever change someone proposes and then map it to investment. Um, but, but nobody's really willing to, to do that uh, because there's still a lot of uncertainty about exactly which user cost you ought to use. Uh, and there are a number of dimensions within which there is uncertainty about that. But one of the main ones uh, is uh, the effect of, of dividend taxes uh, and uh, the, the two views, the new view and, and the old view or traditional view. I, I, why did it change from old to traditional? Do you know? I guess people, somebody didn't want to be called old. 
they want it to be a traditionalist, not an old, uh, maybe it was Jim uh, <laughs> who did it. We'll have to do, do a lit review of that. Uh, but but uh, the, the new and, and the old view have, have strikingly different implications about what would happen if you cut dividend taxes. And so the fact that we cut them, it's kind of you know, fortuitous because it gives us a chance to try to, try to shed light on that. Um, now, the dividend uh, tax cut, uh, Bob Carroll and Jay Mackey and I uh, looked at the effect of that and found that basically under the old view, uh, you can get a pretty big user cost effect. Um, uh, but under the new view, uh, we did cut the capital gains, so we got a little bit. Uh, so, so you get some effect on the user cost, but, but you're going to get a much bigger effect if you think that everybody's an in, in old view, um, an in, in old view firm. Uh, the temporary partial expensing, uh, it, it actually wasn't such a big deal. Uh, so this is Daryl Cohen and Pranilla Hansen and I did a paper in the National Tax Journal on this just to figure out, like, would you expect ex ante if you thought there were a user cost effect that it would give you much investment? And, and it wasn't really such a big deal uh, because what, what, what we're basically doing is we're pulling depreciation deductions that you're going to get anyway into this year at a time when there's really low inflation. And, and, and you know, so the gain isn't necessarily going to be be that big. We, we got, you know, I don't know, two two to four percent might be about what what kind of effect you would get out of, out of the user cost uh, on that. Um, and so, so do, do we think that these things ha had any effect uh, on uh, on what happened? Well, uh, ex ante, um, Alan and I had a paper that was available at the time, which is what I used for my like Senate testimony on this, on what I think would happen, um, where where we. Uh, ran uh, regressions to explore, uh, basically explore the, the dividend payout behavior of uh, firms and see whether they look like they're a new view or old view. Uh, and uh, the, the basic idea of the paper was that under, under the, the old view, uh, your, your dividend is more or less uh, you know, just, just like a payout rate that, that's determined by God. Uh, but under the new view, it's a residual that depends on whether you're investing or not. Uh, and, and so we just ran regressions to see if dividends responded to cash flow and investment uh, holding Q constant uh, to see if firms look new or old view. And we found that they looked about half and half. Um, and so in, in that view, if that were true, then we could get, uh, out of the dividend tax cut, we could get potentially a, a, a pretty big user cost effect if half of firms, especially the ones who account for a lot of investment, um, uh, have their user costs change a lot. Uh, and the partial expensing, it'd be kind of probably hard to see because uh, it was a small enough effect. And uh, so, so you can sort of see now, this is one of those dangerous charts because uh, you put it in, it can easily be abused. Uh, but, but you can sort of see that at least it's possible that, that something happened around uh, the time of the dividend tax, uh, the second one. Uh, but you would certainly want to dig, dig deeper before, before you made any conclusions. Um, whoops, I went the wrong way. Now, uh, now, now subsequently, there have been a number of studies of what happened when the dividend tax changes, changed. And um, the, these studies have, have not yet looked at investment. In fact, in fact, that's kind of the summer project that Alan and I have planned for the research assistant. That he's either his or mine. I forget which one we said is going to do it. Do a lot of the work for us. But 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 we haven't really looked at investment yet. In part because the investment data post dividend tax have, haven't come out yet. Um, but there are other things that you could look at that could shed light on what you think you're going to find when when you look at investment. And uh, the data uh, have not smiled upon the marginal. If effects of the dividend tax. Um, it se seems to me, although there is there is a sense in which in which the, the jury is still out on one important thing. Uh, so Alan and I did an event study. Uh, uh, this is the fir first the first thing that we did for for uh, Joel and Alan's book, um, where where we looked at the days where there was news about the the uh, the dividend uh, tax cut, and then tried to see what kind of share prices price responses we got out five minutes. Okay. What kind of share price responses we we, we got on those event days. Uh, to see if that could help us understand uh, whether firms were a new view um, or, or old view. Now, if the dividend tax uh, cut were viewed to be permanent, uh, then under the old view, if you're a guy who pays a lot of dividends because God said you had to, uh, then that's really good news for you if we cut the dividend tax and we expect your market cap to go up a lot. Um, if the dividend tax is thought to be temporary, then it could be that if you're a high yield firm but you're new view, that your market cap would go up anyway. Uh, and the reason would be that relative to a guy who's low yield, you're going to pay more dividends in the years when the dividend tax is low. Um, and so in our paper, what we did is we first looked to see if firms with high dividend yields uh, outperformed the market on uh, event days. Uh, and then second, uh, using presidential futures uh, and, and later, later on, uh, in, in 2004, 
uh, we looked to see if the notion that Bush was going to get elected and so that perceptions about the permanence of the tax change were changing affected this outperformance. And since I'm down to five minutes, I'm going to skip a whole bunch of tables and just get down to the bottom line, which is that we found that uh, we found that, that uh, firms that had a higher dividend yield uh, outperformed the market uh, uh, amongst uh, dividend-paying firms. Firms that had a high probability of issuing shares uh, outperformed uh, the market as well. And firms that were immature, who had never ever paid a dividend, uh, also outperformed the market. Um, and what we conclude from all that in the end is, uh, and especially after accounting for, for the Bush results, which showed that when people thought the dividend tax cut would be more permanent than the excess return uh, from paying a high dividend uh, went away, uh, that uh, firms looked like they were new view firms in the sample. Uh, that because the, the, the reason we got the outperformance uh, on the event days was that firms that were paying a dividend uh, that, was, uh, that was expected to come while the tax was low uh, were outperforming and not, not because of the traditional, the traditional view. Now, now if, if that's true, uh, then what's going to happen uh, when, we, when we turn uh, to, to the investment data is that we're not going to find much of an investment response from the dividend tax cut, and, we're, and, and that chart that I showed will have been uh, you know, something that was interesting but misleading. Um, but, but the one thing that's interesting is that we also found very, very strong outperformance by immature firms, firms that never paid a dividend, young babies with no earnings, uh, and firms that issue shares. And so if you want to say that there was a big positive economic effect for the dividend tax cut, then where it's going to be found, and it might be found or not in the summer, <laughs> unless someone's racing ahead of us, uh, it is amongst the firms that use uh, that, that are that are baby firms that issue shares now and then to invest. And so, if there was a boom in investment in those baby firms, uh, then maybe the dividend tax uh, will have done something. Uh, put on the wrong way. Um, the uh, Desai and, and Goolsby, uh analyzed uh, the, these uh, two policies uh, to see if they seem to have have an effect. Uh, they they interestingly uh, reproduced big uh, tax effects. Uh, in their investment model uh, and found that cash didn't matter. Uh, they concluded that div the dividend tax cut and partial expensing uh, likely didn't have much effect on investment, um, but they didn't really have any data post the dividend tax cut, uh, so it was more based on a, a priori reasoning and some pretty extreme assumptions. Um, and so, so they uh, assumed, uh, for example, that everybody was, was new view. Uh, and, and, and I don't think that we should go all, all the way there yet. Um, House and Shapiro are the only guys who have studied the uh, partial expensing. And that paper is another must read because it sort of lays out a really interesting corner of the investment uh, literature of where we are. Uh, Goolsby has a 98 paper where he, he argues that when you have an investment tax credit, uh, then maybe investment doesn't go up, it just goes into the supply, uh, it goes into the price because supply is relatively inelastic. Uh, and uh, Glenn and I had a response uh, to that paper uh, where we actually showed uh, that, that the world uh, price of capital goods seems to be about uh, the same no matter where you go. Uh, and, and that local things don't affect uh, supply prices. Uh, but, but since there's two papers and they reach opposite conclusions, uh, then that means you know, it's a heated debate. And House and Shapiro enter that as well. Uh, they find a, a, a cross-section pattern in uh, the response to partial expensing, um, which, because it's expiring, really wants you to accelerate stuff into this year, uh, that's consistent with what we found in the Carnegie and the, and the uh, Brookings uh, paper. Uh, and, and so they did actually find a significant effect on, on capital spending, but again, it was, wasn't huge. Um, and they found no, no price effect uh, at all. And, and, and House and Shapiro argue that it's because of internal adjustment costs, but I, I think it's just because, uh, just because the world market for capital goods is, is kind of open. Um, Ch Chetty and Saez ha ha have some, some interesting work that, that looks at what happened to dividend payments uh, uh, during, during this time, and they found that they went up a lot, and they went up uh, in, in ways that had very interesting relationships uh, uh, to principal agent uh, factors, uh, and uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to, to more work on that, because I think that we're going to find, that, as I said, that w the, the, the place where you'd really love to be would be you know what user costs to use when they, at, they tell you what the tax policy is, and, and, and I think that, that the, it's very hauntingly suggestive uh, in, in their work, that that, that things uh, like uh, you know what the compensation for the executives are and stuff, is and stuff like that are going to be really important for thinking about what what the user cost is. Um, I, ha I have this uh, other thing. I, I didn't since there's another paper on international. I put a little, or Katie and I put a little little bit of a, a section on international in here, and, and I could just uh, sort of because I'm I'm about out of time. I could say say that, that there's this wonderful uh, paper. 
uh, by Clausen's and, and uh, Brookings uh, volume uh, that came out this year where, where she looked at what's going on uh, in terms of uh, investment and, and taxes and, and finding uh, very big elasticities across countries, especially with, with littler countries. Uh, and uh, that, that got uh, a part of mature co-author, an economist at AEI, and, and I thinking that if capital's really moving as much as it looks like uh, uh, Clausen's paper suggests, then maybe you ought to see it, see it in wages. Um, and, and I put this up here now uh, just, just to sort of highlight the fact that it looks like while we've been looking at just domestic investment up until now, it seems like the investment uh, abroad is becoming more and more important uh, and uh, that the elasticities there are really big. Uh, and and uh, you know, Clausen says that it looks like the U.S. is on the wrong side of the Laffer curve in the corporate tax. Uh, and uh, those big elasticities seem to be having an effect uh, here on wages. So, so Parna and I uh, just, just did this study where we did a big panel, panel study of wages and the determinants and put in the normal things, but then put in sort of capital side things too. And we found that, that basically it looks like we might be moving to a world where, where la labor uh, you know, b bears a, a, lot of, a, lot, a lot of different taxes. Um, but but uh, as the capital moves, the, the wages appear to go up. Um, and then the final point, is that to the extent that you think, and, 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 and maybe I've convinced you of this, and, and uh, maybe it's temporary because uh, Bob will, will, uh, will leave you uh, less convinced, uh, but to the extent that you think that we're beginning to understand investment, and especially investment in equipment, structures has always been really hard to understand, but is, then, then you might think that that's really good news and that means that we'll understand the world better than we used to, but, but it seems like that's actually you know, not, not so true. Because while we've been getting, been studying investment and, and, and getting down into the nitty gritty about what's going on in investment, um, the, the types of things that firms are doing have changed a lot. And, and in particular, uh, we're, we're, now, we're now in a world where, where investment in intangibles, according to uh, uh, Corrado Hilton and Sickles uh, Fed study that just came out, uh, that, that we're now in a world, and, and let's fast forward this 03 chart uh, past that, uh, where intangibles are you know, probably a lot bigger than BFI. Intangible investment, uh, and, and, and so and so so our, our growth, our growth has come uh, in the past maybe from making more Chevettes each year with more machines, and now we're making new things with intangible investment. And let me tell you, the investment literature has not really done a whole lot on intangibles, uh, and, and that's something that we really got to do uh, because it's now bigger than than BFI itself, and and so. Um, I think investment, to conclude, and I'm out of time, so I'm going to really speak quickly. Investments widely held to be quite sensitive to tax policy. Liquidity effects seem less widely supported than they were previously. Uh, the response to expensing seems pretty much consistent with our expectations. The dividend tax reductions had a big effect on value and, and payout, I think, and the investment effects, we don't know yet. Um, uh, and I, I think if we find them, it's going to be because of immature firms doing a lot. And uh, intangibles are increasingly important, and we haven't done much study of that. Uh, if I had a, a student who was starting a dissertation, I'd, I'd, I'd encourage them to head, head in that direction. Um, and maybe get Joel Deline on the NSF to support that as well. Okay, thank you. Bob? Great, it's a pleasure to be here. I thank the organizers for uh, inviting me to uh, uh, participate in this uh, conference. Um, what I'd like to do uh, today is to uh, spend a little time uh, finding the um, um, commenting on uh, basically the what I see is the sort of central contribution of the Hassett Newmark paper, and then I want to work through the template that's been given to us by the organizers with the threat that they're not going to honor our expenses if we don't uh, <laughs> present things this way. And initially, I might say I was kind of annoyed by it because I found it didn't work, but. <laughs> Ex post, I think it works okay. Uh, so uh, but you, you can tell me in about 10 minutes or so. And I want to focus on the known and the unknown on five points that uh, Kevin has talked about. Uh, the cost of capital, uh, production function parameters, both in terms of estimation and inference, um, intangibles, as he talked about, and then corporate governance, which he did not, but I mentioned it in, in, in passing, uh, and then close on what's the unknowable that we have here. Okay. Like, there's a lot of material, obviously, in the paper by, um, by Kevin and Katie, I mentioned sort of a singular contribution because some of it, as he mentioned, is, uh, is related to previous work that he had done in terms of a survey. Um, but the real insight here is to take advantage of the new changes in the tax code, the ones that have occurred 2001, 2002, 2003, uh, and to basically report on the new evidence that we have as a result of that. 
Okay. I don't have a particular comments there to get into a lot of econometric details. What I wanted to focus on were some uh, of the lessons that I learned in terms of the, the, the five points that I want to focus on that I think are relevant to understanding whether or not tax policy has a big or small impact on capital formation. Okay. The first one of these is the cost of capital. Uh, what do we know? Well, what we know, I think, with reasonable certainty is that we have a conceptual framework for quantifying tax incentives. This is the so-called you know, user cost of capital. It does seem to be something that just about everybody uses in their empirical analysis. With that, I don't think there's too much dispute. It's kind of hard to find. However, what, what don't we know? I think what we're not so sure about uh, is the slippages that occur between legislated tax policies and the variables that appear in the user cost. And you go through the paper, you start sort of wondering whether or not this is going to be a useful concept. Because Kevin, Katie sort of lists a lot of the issues that go on. Um, several of them he talked about. Let me review them briefly. Uh, first and perhaps foremost is this ongoing debate for how many years, 25 or 30 years, about which way we should view dividend taxes. And is this the new view or the traditional view? Um, and of course, the impact that we have on financing costs. Uh, financing costs. There's issues of timing, of which, of course, the bonus depreciation points out that uh, the timing kind of issues that are sort of subtle in the tax code may not translate very easily to what's true in the user cost of capital. There's a whole long discussion about international taxation, which Kevin didn't get a chance to talk about. Uh, clearly, um, issues about tax havens, income shifting, transfer pricing, all create wedges between the user cost variables that we have um, and the um, um, the user cost variable we have to use and all the sort of complexities and the nuances that are in the, um, uh, the tax code. So of course what all this means is that um, it adds a lot of measurement errors to user cost. Now I wouldn't be quick to say that it therefore means that all responses of capital formation to user cost are downward biased. That's only when measurement error behaves itself in a nice vanilla form. The measurement errors that I'm talking about here are pretty substantial, I think. Uh, and so I just raised the question as to whether or not um, this is, uh, you know, uh, whether or not the actual measurement of the user cost is one of those unknown things that we have. I end with a piece of data, which is uh, from the 1986 Tax Act from uh, Valentine, published in the National Tax Association Papers and Proceedings. And he notes that. Um, uh, when he looked at the, at the Tax Reform Act of 1986, that only 8% of the dollar volume of corporate uh, tax increases were reflected in variables in the user cost. Now, of course, on the one hand, Ballantyne's talking about average calcu ca uh, computations and user cost is talking about marginal computations. But the divorce between what's there in terms of this, uh, the number here, the 8% number, is something that should give us pause in regards to how we basically compute the cost of capital. Let me move on then to a second issue which is about uh, the estimation of um, production function parameters. One of the things that we know clearly, I think, from economic theory um, are basically static production relationships. We have a pretty good feel between that there's output on the left-hand side and there's production function mapping inputs from the right-hand side over to output. Okay. That I think we're pretty confident of. Um, you know, how we specify that, we sure, surely should not, in tax policy analysis, use Cobb-Douglas since there's the implicit assumption that the elasticity of substitution is unity, that's not quite the way to go. But certainly the CES constant elasticity of substitution production function with sigma is certainly one way of thinking about that. Maybe you don't like some of the implicit assumptions in that form and you want flexible functional forms, so you do what the Jorgensen does and do translog estimation. But nonetheless, production function I think is a pretty well established thing and there's not going to be too much controversy about at least its general form um, of that production function. But what we don't don't know so much is the values of those production function parameters, and I think that's where the, 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 the uh, contentious uh, kind of issues are. Um, let me divide between sort of low signal to noise and high signal to noise ways of trying to estimate those production functions parameters. Okay, the low signal to noise are kind of characterized, I feel, by when people have used investment data. And a lot of the pictures that Kevin showed were basically with investment data. And the reason that there's a lot of uh, noise in these relationships is for a lot of the points that Kevin raised during his talk. Uh, think about adjustment costs. The usual traditional model is one of convex adjustment costs that have been accepted for a long period of time, but worked over the last 10 or 15 years, represented by that spiked diagram that Kevin had with Q and in, in, uh, investment. Um, suggest that adjustment costs may be much more complicated. The non-convexities, irreversibilities, fixed costs, all those things may be creating problems. 
Uh, other issues that he talked about are the issues about financing costs. Ten or 15 years ago, people were very keen on financing costs as being important for investment. More recent work, obviously Kevin's paper coming out soon, uh, suggests an alternative uh, interpretation. Um, stock market Q was used for a while as being uh, relatively informative for investment, um, but then we got concerned, especially in the 90s, about equity market, market misvaluations. Issues about the supply curve of capital, the Austin Goolsbee point that Kevin may, may mentioned, and of course uh, his, uh, his article with uh, Glenn Hubbard, uh, which moved in the opposite direction. Now what these points should tell you, especially three, four, uh, two, three, and four, financing costs, Q and equity markets, and slopes of the supply curve, uh, is that uh, one of two things, either that Kevin uh, is a contentious person because he's on both sides, he's on uh, you know, a substantial debate in each one of those, uh, or there's a lot of uncertainty in those areas. And I would take the, the former conclusion, I won't necessarily reject, but the latter one I need to use for the rest of this talk, uh, which is to say that there's a lot of uncertainty as to how we model investment. Therefore, there's going to be a lot of signal, uh, there's going to be low signal to noise uh, in this kind of, uh, these kind of models. There's going to be a lot of transitory variation, transitory shocks that we're not going to want to uh, be very useful in terms of trying to identify production function parameters. Okay, so what's the alternative? Well, we want to go to high signal to noise kind of estimation strategies. Okay, and uh, there's basically three ways that people have been doing that. One way is basically to look at substantial tax changes, and me, Kevin mentioned that during the talk in the, in the, in the paper. Uh, that uh, with uh, Alan Arbach in one version and then with Cummins and Hubbard in, in other papers with panel data, they look at where there's major changes in tax policy, arguing that the signal content is going to be really substantial there. So some of the concerns that we talked about in the previous slide will be kind of washed away. It seems like a really sensible, um, sensible kind of strategy. Um, other strategies, though, uh, basically uh, move away from investment data. Because once you have investment data, you have to worry about transitions between points, and then things like adjustment costs and financing costs become important. Okay? Another way of doing that is trying to avoid it. Okay? Avoid it entirely by looking at capital stocks. Uh, and one branch of that literature looks at uh, co-integration analysis. Uh, that is to say, looking at the uh, ways in which capital stocks and user costs move through time, arguing that there's a, a certain properties, unit root properties, and that they, in fact uh, uh, the two series are co-integrated. Caballero, uh, a long time ago, in an aggregate paper, and Schaller, in more recent work, have looked at that and found some pretty substantial user cost elasticities. Okay. The point I'm making here is I choose to focus on sort of long-run issues, and let's try to get away from the medium-run and the short-run kind of issues that are associated with investment. Data. And another way of going about that is something that I've been involved in, again, looking at capital stocks, but using so-called spectral methods, which allow you very naturally to focus on long-run issues and hence avoid all of the adjustment costs, financing costs, and all the other contentious issues that were on the previous slide. Okay. Um, so again, I think what we are, are a little bit uncertain of are these exact parameter values um, and a suggestion here as to how we might go about uh, uh, getting a little better knowledge there. A third point, again on production function parameters, though, is inference. One of the things that we know, um, in, in good part, is that we have some estimated parameters for microdata, with, uh, which seem to be a little bit more, a little bit more certain than we had perhaps previously with time series estimates. Now, notwithstanding the previous slide, which raised some issues about these parameters, let's take for the sake of discussion that we have some reasonably good estimates uh, from panel data. I think the vast majority of people doing tax policy analysis these days would focus on panel data as opposed to, to the aggregate. So I think that's all for the good. Okay, but the, there's a real problem here. And the unknown then is how do we map from these micro parameters into, the ma into macro parameters, which is what we care about. Because at the end, uh, we're not interested so much in investment in a particular sector. What we're we can care much more about is sort of what the effects are on the overall economy. So you have these micro parameters estimated in, in, in studies that I've been involved in, Ken and many others. Uh, it's also true for the uh, second paper today, um, uh, looking at, at things from the household side. Uh, how do we map from those micro parameters to the macro parameters when those environments are just radically different? Okay. Think about the following conundrum, if you will. Let's say that you estimated an elasticity of substitution at the industry level of zero. Okay. Um, and it was zero basically for all sectors of the economy. And there was some macroeconomic tax policy change. 
you know that the price elasticity of demand for capital is not going to be zero. Okay? And the reason is because there's going to be shifting between the sectors. Even though there's no substitution between labor and capital, uh, some industries that have a lot of capital intensivity are going to get a windfall. Um, they're going to be able to lower their prices, and resources are going to flow, at least in the long run, towards those, uh, towards those industries. Okay? So the question, so you could estimate these sigmas at the industry level, all be zero, but nonetheless, you know when you move to the aggregate environment, that's not quite right. Okay? You need more information. So that's my point here. Now, Hicks has a formula, um, certainly that is uh, commonplace in labor economics textbooks, relating that elasticity, uh, as we have here, uh, to various uh, substitution elasticities as represented by sigma, uh, as well as the um, capital share represented by capital, by kappa, uh, and then eta, of course, being the demand elasticity. And so you have this sort of formula, and that sort of gets you out of the conundrum. But once you do that, um, you still have this problem. Um, the aggregate lambda, the aggregate price elasticity that we're going to care about, is going to be a weighted average of the individual price elasticities. Okay? That's fine. Um, but then we have some additional problems, and I don't have resolutions to these problems. I just raise them. Um, and once you move to the aggregate level, what are we doing about tax revenues? Clearly imposing some tax policy giving a shift of resources from one sector of the economy to the other is going to basically increase capital formation as firms slide down their, their demand curve at the minimum. Uh, but what, how, what sort of compensations do we do to try to make that experiment uh, reasonable? Uh, moreover, there's, let's say there's a fixed uh, amount of labor in the, in the economy as uh, different industries basically increase or decrease their capital intensivities. Uh, how do we allocate labor between those sectors? So I don't really know what the answer is. But what I do know is panel data is kind of useful for getting good parameter estimates. I think econometrically, Nebula is favorite. But how we then map that those parameters into something that we care about in terms of tax policy analysis, I would leave in the unknown uh, category. Okay. The fourth thing, and, and uh, Kevin mentioned at the end, I'm very really glad because he has a very short piece in the paper at the end is the role of intangibles. Um, what we know about them is that they're clearly very important. Remember the last uh, chart that Kevin had, uh, which basically indicates that intangible investment is now greater than tangible investment in the economy. Yet we're focusing a lot of resources um, on looking at tangible investment, and the unknown is just about everything with respect to intangible investment. Uh, there's very little work that's been done. I can only think of uh, two, stud two studies, one uh, which is uh, Bob Hall's work looking at the stock market, trying to say what the role of intangible investment was. Uh, there was a paper by Bond and Cummins in the Brookings papers, I think, that looked at this as well, but that had some methodological difficulties. Um, so certainly a fourth point that I would uh, take here and ratify what Kevin mentioned in the talk. The last point is something that's not in the paper, but since we're in Houston today, uh, it seems to me that I probably uh, mentioned it uh, anyway, um, which is um, about the known. Okay, what we know uh, is that when, when uh, people think of dividends, okay, and you're in a public finance audience, you always think about the double taxation of dividends, and if you're in a corporate finance audience, you would always think about agency and corporate governance problems, okay, and you wouldn't think too much about taxes. Maybe we should bring those two together to some extent. What we certainly know is that there's a prevalence of agency and free cash flow problems in the economy, uh, and that firms basically invest as if the discount rate is very low for those so-called free cash flow Michael Jensen type firms. Okay. Uh, that's certainly, I think, not uh, too much in dispute. What's unknown, though, is from the point of view of what's relevant for this conference, is the impact of the link between these corporate governance problems uh, and capital formation and user costs. That really hasn't been worked out too much, and that's probably um, of some importance. Dividends clearly have a role in attenuating corporate governance problems. Indeed, the paper mentions that, and I have a quote there at the bottom, that investors were increasingly evaluating firms based on dividends during the years in which uh, corporate governance problems were becoming more, uh, more evident. Uh, so what I think we don't know is how these corporate governance problems are going to affect our, our estimates of the response of firms to, to the tax code. Okay. So we're at, running out of time. Okay. Lastly, uh, and to the last slide, uh, is the unknowable. Okay. Because so far I haven't really touched on this one. Let me say what's unknowable. What's definitely unknowable are definitive parameter estimates. Can I emphasize the word definitive? Uh, because there's going to be lots of controversies, and even if you pick my preferred method of estimating 
uh, um, estimating parameters using long-run capital stock data. Uh, there's still going to be uncertainties with respect to to, uh, to the way uh, one gets estimates. Uh, one thing I would say is that, however, is that the range is narrowing. Okay. And here, Kevin and I agree um, that, say, prior to the recent rash of panel data estimates, estimates of lambda, that tax uh, response, uh, the, 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 the price elasticity parameter that we care about, varied from pretty much zero to one. You would see a lot of studies, some of which would have my name on it at the lower end, and certainly a lot of other people would tend to take a, a very high response. More recent work, some of it based, uh, almost all of it based on panel data, has kind of narrowed the range. And the range of the low guys, uh, which I count myself in, is our numbers like 0.25 to 0.4, and ranges that I see for people like Kevin, and maybe I'm misinterpreting his work, and you can certainly correct me on this, are ranges that are a bit higher, 0.66 to 0.88, and so on, uh, certainly a little bit away from one. Um, so I don't think we have quite convergence. Um, I think we're moving a little closer to that. Um, but what I would conclude at the end here is that we definitely need a range of uh, simulations with everything doing tax policy analysis. Even though these estimates may not seem terribly far apart, certainly uh, they can make really major differences in any kind of tax policy advantage. Thank you. He's on here. He couldn't make it. Oh. <laughs> we're done. Uh, well, should I go? Should I go? So, floor's open. Just a question, Kevin. And in, intangibles, in do you include advertising? They, uh, excuse me, in this, this the Corrado sickle uh, thing, they, they have intangibles uh, broken up into two types. Uh, and uh, one is like the generation of R&D related things. And the other is the generation of like, you know, Coke is it kind of things. <laughs> and and uh, it's about half um, each. So, 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 so that thing that I showed you was half Coke is it. Now and and half R and R R and D and things. You could like. argue that that's not a lot of that. And it's not really investment if you're putting something in this paper that, you know, what your price of meat today is the supermarket. I mean, that's really not a form of investment. Yeah, I guess. Or day, you know. Yeah, I guess if you're if we're saying you know half off tomorrow. Right. Uh, <laughs> that's that's right. But a lot of it is building equity shortly. Is it correct to assume that for the purposes of this analysis, you've ignored demand? Um, no. Uh, and so, so, but there's also, also you have to talk about which, which demand you're, you're For example, if I'm going to build a pipeline. Right. I've got to have customers that'll take the capacity of that pipeline. Right. And, and so, what in our models, what we're assuming is that, that you know what the price is that you can sell that for. And, and, and that given that price, you then decide what to do. So, the only variable is the cost of capital as opposed to the return. Uh, well, you can calculate your, yeah, you, the, the, you, you want to know, ultimately you care about making as most money possible given what price you can sell the stuff for. And, and, but, but, uh, but in the, the models that we've been using and analyzing, we don't let what you do affect the price. Kevin, some of the recent uh, tax incentives had a larger impact if you were a small firm or a large firm, particularly expensing that was, you know, the limit on the expensing ceiling was in the $100,000 range. So if you were a you know, Fortune 500 firm or a firm of the companies that day, this is sort of irrelevant if you're a small firm, it might be a big, bigger deal. Is there any way to study the differential responses of the, the little firms versus the big firms? And can tax return data be used to do that? Or has anyone done that in trying to see whether these recent reforms had a bigger effect? Yeah, and, and in addition, Jim, Jim, you actually uh, point out an, an important and, and uh, you know, probably bad omission on my part, uh, which is that at the same time that Congress has been doing this stuff, they've been doing all sorts of stuff for small business uh, that, that's much different from the stuff that I've characterized and, and uh, could be potentially quite interesting uh, variation to, to explore. Uh, as, as you know, the small business data tend to be really hard uh, to use. It seems like part, part of the problem is that the Small Business Administration doesn't want to give us good enough data so we could actually tell whether what they're doing makes any sense. Uh, but, you know, so you don't want to actually be able to you know, see if the, if the loan worked out or something. And so so, anyway, so it's, it's, not, it's, it's an area that's not filled with papers. But as you said, the tax, the, I think the best papers have been the stuff that's been come out of the Treasury Department. 
and some of it probably when you were probably started when you were there, Tom. <laughs> Kevin, you characterized the Eureka moment when you and uh, Alan saw that uh, graph of change in user costs by a asset type mm -hmm. and the change in investment. Um, some of that is possibly asset substitution. If you're going to use this kind of capital versus the other. Mm -hmm. What is the relevance of uh, these sorts of elasticities to the tax policy models that we're used to using with one kind of capital? Yeah, yeah, thanks. That, that, uh that question is is hotly contested, as, as I think Bob really ably pointed out, uh, and I, I really you know obviously don't know, don't know the answer. I know that that in in uh, the Brookings papers uh, we we did sort of the experiment uh, that that Alan and I did first uh, uh, in sort of every tax reform that was big enough so you could do it, and and more or less got the same answer every time. So you could see the same kind of assets moving around in response to the user costs, uh, but. Uh, you, you know, and, and really, I think Leo, your your point might have even almost been driving at, at this that that uh, we were sort of smooth, smoothing out that interest rate thing that caused the problem in the first place. We were just saying, oh, I don't know if next year we're going to have more investment or not because there's so much in the aggregate changing. And uh, Jim Hines uh, ha has a, has a paper where he suggests that that uh, you you would get a lot of movement around, but you wouldn't necessarily get more. Uh, and and uh, we haven't moved from seeing all the, move, the cross section moving around to a world where we have a model that, that we believe in enough to, to say that we know the stuff's going to go up. Uh, Shapiro and House try to do this, and, and uh, it's a very interesting exercise. Uh, and uh, you know, so, so, so they they have a, an interest rate uh, that's determined endogenously with all this, and it helps sort of mute, mute the effect uh, of the policy. Uh, so so. You know, yeah, I, I think it's possible that that there's a lot more in the cross section than, than there is at, at the top line, and uh, but this this is where where Bob's point I, I should reemphasize the importance of it, it is that that the we don't know the production technology um, that for for the, all this cross section stuff very well. So so so, so it could be. That, that what we really need to do is have like some kind of big translog thing help us understand whether we're actually substituting 19 for 17, um, or, or, or whether it's just that each one of those guys is his own self, and, and he went up, but the other guy went down. When you looked at uh, high dividends versus low dividend firms, did you um, think about the fact some firms may have like? Uh, maybe you split it up between high institutional shareholders and low institutional shareholders. In the fact, it's like oil, you know, major pension plan wouldn't have a would, would, would take more dividends than just an individual investor because of the deferral of that. Yeah, we we did a, a whole bunch of. Uh uh, in fact, one of, one of the results I didn't get to that, that I meant to, this gives me an opportunity. <laughs> we did, did, did a, a whole bunch of, of trying to check the sensitivity of what, what we're doing. This is in the share price response paper. Is that, that the one? Um, the, the thing that, that we found, one of the things that we found that, that mattered the most uh, uh, that was puzzling was uh, whether we thought that if you were in an industry where there were a lot of old view guys, then you might not like the dividend tax cut Suppose you're a new view guy and you're surrounded by old view guys, and then there's a dividend tax cut. The old view guys invest like crazy. That's bad for you, <laughs> right? And, and, and so, so we sort of thought we looked we looked at whether the characteristics of other firms would affect your return, and we found that it did quite significantly, but it had the wrong sign. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so if you're in an industry where we think there'd be a big user cost effect from, from the dividend uh, tax cut, uh, which would hurt your profits, it actually helped your value. Um, but, but the institutional investor stuff, I, I don't know, Alan, did any other runs we do? Because we, we did a bunch of stuff in response to, to comments, and they didn't all make the paper. I don't remember if we did. something in about institutional investors. I honestly can't remember. I remember it didn't matter. But we did also do some, like a bunch of stuff on the, like the CAPM. Controls and well, that didn't make. And that didn't make it. Well, yeah, I think that was one of the things we looked at, and and then we found that it had no effect on our results, and then it ultimately didn't make the cut of the paper. But we did put something. That, did do something on institutional investors, but I, I, I can't remember what we were talking about. Yeah, Kevin, I think one of the papers you cite, which is the Brown, Weissbender, and Lang paper, which also looks at the 
given in response. I think they make a substantial deal of the institutional investor versus individual investor split. It works the way you expect. I think that firms that have larger institutional owners, right. at least tax exempt institutional owners, tend to have smaller dividend responses to the, to the O3X. The other thing that they find is that the, they look at the option ownership by the top executives right, and play off this control, uh, can, you know, this corporate governance issue of whether the executives have unprotected uh, options where the straight to pay off dividends is going to reduce the, the prospective value of the options. You see a larger uh, disincentive to pay dividends in those cases. So, in fact, what you see is in, in firms with either uh, you know, relatively few institutional owners or uh, relatively little uh, stock option ownership by the top executives, the, apparently the dividend response is larger. Though. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And, and, and this was. I think I'm yeah, you know, that's, that's, I remember it that way, too. And I, and I also uh, think, think that Emmanuel's paper. Um, that, that, that you know it goes goes into a lot a lot of the same issues and finds lots of very interesting stuff and so so but it sort of leaves us with with the sort of next thing another next thing to look into which is that we've got uh, lots of this stuff uh, firm level characteristic uh, that seems to affect your payout behavior uh, but when we tried to see it in the value we we didn't um, and, and sort of puzzling over whether that's really true and what it, what it means might be a nice next thing to look into. Kevin, uh, you mentioned in passing that you're having the most success in explaining structure investment. Is that troubling? I mean, that's the long life investment where you expect user cost to be important. And, and if useful lives are getting smaller and smaller, user cost, you know, capital is like paper clips, and you wouldn't expect user cost to matter. So why is it that in the, in the place you'd expect to see user cost matter and you can't? I think it gets to another thing that Bob said that, that uh, you know, I wish I said. That, that uh, there's all this stuff in the code that's not in the user costs, uh, and and, uh, and it's getting worse every day. <laughs> and, and and so so it used to be if you sort of knew tau and you knew z that you were home free, right? But now there's all this stuff going on, uh, and in structures that was really true, right? So we we got the boom uh, that, that was was killed in '86, um, and uh, you know you know I, with all, with basically things that weren't in, weren't in the user costs. So so the problem has been that if you just take like the asset life. Of a building, and and then you know they there are a few buildings uh, like utilities buildings got investment tax credits. So there's one other. Do you remember what the other one was? Well, there were two every, types of buildings. Everything in Texas. Everything in Texas. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> oil, 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 pipe, oil and gas type yeah, structures. Uh, uh, but 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 so so that basically it's just the depreciation of life. And, and and I think that things like the rules about partnerships and stuff like that just they had a much bigger effect on the real estate market than all that. And that that's definitely. Uh, have you experimented with any other uh, uh, measures of your Q hat variable? Uh, for example, would it make any sense to look at uh, actual realizations of cash flows and adjust the market Q and see if you get an improved value of Q hat using that? Yeah, the the, uh, the guys who are doing the, the expectations are adjusting um, their earnings expectations in real time. And so, so like if there was news about a firm yesterday, then in, in the next Q hat, it'll be built into the whole pipeline of things that they go into queue. Um, but, but but since our paper first came out, um, there have been basically it's almost like now standard. I, I know you did it in your papers. Like everybody is using these IBIS uh, variables as instruments, uh, you know, in all sorts of different models, and, and they're always found to be real, really helpful, um, at least in the, in the investment context. If you focus on the period before and after tax changes with event studies to see what the effects are on investment, one question is whether what you're picking up is a very temporary response, shifting the timing of investment or even when it's reported, uh, rather than a long-run effect on investment. Uh, to what degree can you parcel out these transitory versus permanent effects if you focus on event studies? Right, because because the the problem this this gets into also the, the idea of signal to noise that that, that so uh, when when the partial expensing if we thought the partial expensing would be permanent then I think if I remember right my our, our best estimate for our paper was that maybe the user cost would drop by like three and a half percent or something uh, but the year that it expires the user cost drops by twenty percent because you want to get all that stuff in in December uh, and, 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 so, and so we get so we get these bursts. They give us a moment where there's enough tax variation where we can observe things. Uh, but 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 if you put on a, a, a partial expensing measure and then take it off, then the long run target capital stock doesn't change, right? And so you just sort of trying to get this stuff while it's cheap. Um, and, and and so there's there's sort of a, a problem that that we're identifying uh, off of variation and stuff that's sort of going on and coming off. 
Um, and, and, and so the longer run, run effect um, it's not necessarily something that's easy to identify. The one paper, uh, actually there's two paper, you have a spectral uh, paper. I'll let you talk about it. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, 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 that's right, yeah, and, 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 and so there's two, two good papers on this. This is a spectral paper and the Caballero uh, paper where, where uh, he basically uses a stock Watson filter that's meant to sort of tease out what's going on at the zero frequency uh, to, to the capital stock uh, in response to stuff. And, and finds and estimates the user, user cost elasticity that way, and, and he gets a pretty big elasticity. And I guess you might expect that because uh, if, it, if you're going up a little bit, but keeping it there for a long time, then the capital stock change could be big. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah the, the he he just mentioned about the big elasticity was Cavalier, not me, for one. Yeah. Um, um, for two, the, but this is the reason why, at least my own argument, is why we want to go away from investment data because you have these kind of timing issues. You want to kind of maybe look at the capital stock and then focus on the long run movements in the capital stock. And there's two ways to do it: the Caballero way, with stock Watson corrections you're, you're talking about, and then using these spectral methods, which allow you to focus just on the New York frequency. But it's exactly for, for that timing reason uh, that I kind of favor the latter. Yes, you said all all sorts of things that have to don't get into uh, the user cost of capital, probably because I think the politicians have figured out the. Uh, the user cost of capital gets so much attention, but in case, that, would, that would suggest that would suggest the average tax rate just gives you some information. Now, have you ever tried to do that? Now, if in fact in our studies of multinationals, if you look at U.S. Right. investment abroad, the average tax rate, uh, which we can calculate from uh, what they what they report, in fact, that's better than the user cost of capital, where you have the user cost of capital for the European countries. For yeah, that's right. That's a good point. And, and there's all this work you guys participated in, and and uh, keen endeavor. And like all, all those folks over on that side of the ocean too, to have, have uh, you know specified average versus marginal rates, and found often that the average rate matters matters a lot more. Uh, domestically, I'm not aware of just sort of the straight U.S. domestic study that's thought thought about how, how to use the averages to to learn something. It's probably a good thing to try. Mm -hmm. Um, Kevin, uh, I'm curious in the in the event studies of is because so many of the bills increasingly now have um, have provisions which have deferred effective date. Is there any effort to uh, or has there ever been an effort to kind of distinguish between the effects of provisions that go into effect immediately versus ones that are simply scheduled to go into effect but don't? And, and would that make any difference? Hmm. Yeah, I'm not aware. I'm, I'm not aware of, of, of a study of something where they said they were going to do something and didn't. Um, there were times when they when they when they started debates. Uh, so, so this is something that could be done. It might be very interesting. There, there, there have been times where they started debates and they said, "Well, now we're talking about the investment tax credit, and if it passes, it'll be retroactive to today." Um, and then I don't know if there have been times when they said that and then they didn't pass it. And that would be the interesting thing to investigate. Yeah. In the same vein, what about when uh, legislation stipulates an expiration date? Yeah, so, so the, the, the stipulated expiration date is sort of where we're getting the action in our dividend study. Um, and also really in the partial expensing study. So what, well. what do you believe about yeah. stipulated expiration? Well, well, so, so what, we did, what we did is we said, well, whatever it is that people believe that, that if Bush is elected, then, then their prior about the dividend tax staying should, should you know, the probability should go up. And if Kerry's elected, it should, should go down. And then what we did is we took the, the Iowa futures uh, and, and for Bush and then watched it go up and down and then looked at the outperformance of sort of new view versus old view firms during this time and, and found that it sort of matched what we found earlier uh, in, in, the event, in the event study. Yeah, there we have one, one last question. Do you want to look at and consider the uh, impact of the lower tax on repatriating money? From overseas uh, and factor that into the cost of capital. Yeah, that, that so. So the, the, the question was, what about this this uh, hot tax holiday? Um, you know, we, we we haven't studied that. I, I think that that I might I might be alone in thinking this, but I, I didn't expect that it would have much effect on, on anything. It's just uh, uh, except that firms will now think that maybe it'll happen again. It had a huge effect on repatriation. It's had a huge effect on repatriation, but I don't think it had an effect on their cost of capital. Yeah, they paid that debt. Yeah, they, 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 but 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 I have not. I don't think I've seen a study other than just knowing that they were taking it. Is there any someone else who's desperate to ask a question? Yeah. 
Thank you. 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 Thank you.